thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are presenting the Global Digital Divide. Um, I am going to be the moderator for today's panel. My name is Kenna Hughes-Castleberry. I'm a science journalist and part of the Inside Quantum Technology team. Um, I'm also the public information officer at JILA, um, which is a world-leading quantum physics research institute here in Colorado. Um, this meeting or this uh, event is being recorded and will be um, distributed after uh, this event. So please keep your inboxes open for that. Now, I have the honor of moderating this panel, um, which features both Jack Hittery and Pete Chappell. Um, Jack is the CEO of Sandbox AQ, an enterprise SAAS company delivering solutions that leverage the combined power of quantum technology and AI. Jack and his team spun out Sandbox AQ out of Alphabet, where Jack was head of AI and quantum at Google X for six plus years. He's the author of Quantum Computing and Applied Approach, one of the leading textbooks in the field and is used in both PhD programs and corporate training sessions. Jack is the trustee of the X Prize Foundation and a member of the World Economic Forum Global Futures Council. And with us is Pete Chadbolt. He is the co-founder and chief scientific officer of PsyQuantum, a quantum computing company on a mission to, world, to build the world's first commercially useful quantum computers and deploy it to tackle some of the greatest challenges we face across climate, tech, energy, pharma, defense, financial services, and beyond. He has been awarded the 2014 EPSRC Rising Star by the British Research Council, the EPSRC Recognizing Inspirational Scientists and Engineers Award, and the European Physics Society Thesis Prize. Um, so I will turn it over to Jack and Pete um, just to kind of introduce themselves a little bit further. Thank you both for taking the time to chat with us today. Hey, Ken, it's Jack Hittery. Great to be with you. Great, Pete, great to see you again. Great to be with you here and collaborate with you on this webinar. Uh, this is a critical moment in the time of quantum technologies, and I'm excited we're going to get into the core issues. Uh, Ken, as you mentioned, uh, I'm founder and CEO of Sandbox AQ, the A for AI, the Q for quantum. Uh, if there's time later, we can talk about the interplay of AI and quantum. Uh, and it's an exciting time because we were able to uh, spin out at a critical moment in the timeline of quantum technology about a year ago and start to scale up our solutions uh, across the world. We're now in more than a dozen countries around the world and serving in a B2B capacity, uh, lots of great companies around the world and developing technology in the computing field on the software side, complementing great companies like PsyQuantum uh, that Pete co-founded on the hardware side, uh, but also focused on areas such as a simulation as well as quantum sensing, which I think we'll get to. Pete, turn it over to you. Hey, sorry, I lost audio for a moment there. And uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'm Pete, uh, I'm a co-founder of PsyQuantum. We're a quantum computing company. Um, and we are really just uh, doing one thing, uh, which is that we are building a large scale fault tolerant quantum computer, the real quantum computer that people have always wanted. Excellent. Well, thank you both so much for telling us a little bit more about yourselves. We'll get started here with the first question. Um, quantum technology covers a broad range of exciting technologies, including quantum computers, quantum sensing, and quantum communications. Um, so let's start with maybe a little bit about computing, and then we'll turn it over to the other technologies as well. Um, this question I'll turn over to Pete first, but briefly, how is a quantum computer different from a classical computer? And do we have a sense of when this technology will be available? Yeah, so um, if you think about kind of the vanguard of human technical achievement on the planet, uh, whether that is nuclear power, supersonic flight, semiconductor manufacturing, robotics, all of these kind of wonderful uh, technologies, which of course sort of are the, the foundation of the, the Fortune 100, Fortune 500, et cetera, it's important to remember that they were science fiction 50 years ago, and we have made them real uh, in the last 50 years. And we've made them real thanks to human mastery of our physical world. The fact that we can simulate, model, design, calculate, predict the way that materials and molecules and chemistry and physics behave, that has been instrumental in, in us being able to, to achieve these kind of miracles. And a quantum computer for a long time has been seen as the single most impactful machine that we could build to categorically improve our mastery of the physical world. So it's been this kind of dream technology uh, that calculates things in a very, very different way. Essentially, it changes the rules 
of what we can do with information. The problem is that it has been a sort of science fiction technology itself, right? It's been stuck in university research labs at a very primitive stage of development. And our you know, belief is that we can escape from that regime. And in fact, today, our company is building thousands of wafers of silicon uh, with integrated quantum devices, so superconducting single photon detectors, single photon sources, stuff like that. We're building that in the production line of the most mature semiconductor manufacturing fab uh, in the United States. And we've been doing that for years. So we don't have a quantum computer yet, but we think we have found a very short path to very large scale systems, leveraging that you know trillion dollars of investment that has gone into the semiconductor industry over the last 50 years. And we're optimistic that we will have these systems uh, well, well within the decade. Um, uh, yeah, so we think we can uh, we can escape the lab and get these things built real quick. Excellent. And, Ken, and how if about I, you, Jeff? If I can just maybe, yeah, if I can just add to uh, what Pete's um, already mentioned. First, uh, completely agreed. Uh, we're now entering. We're really the first human generation that will have mastery at scale uh, at the quantum level. Uh, the fundamental building blocks of our entire universe are quantum mechanics in nature and uh, the ability to harness and be able to model, simulate, design at that level of nature, uh, at the atomic, subatomic, molecular level. This is the level of pharmaceuticals, of molecule to medicine. This is the level of material design, of creating clean energy solutions that I hope we'll get to, Kenna, in our conversation today together with Pete. This is a very exciting moment for humanity. And... Uh, there are a lot of ways of building a quantum computer. We at Sandbox AQ strategically chose not to be the one ones to build a quantum computer because we wanted to work with folks like Pete and Jeremy and the great team at SciQuantum uh, and others who are building these incredible machines. Um, of the seven major ways of building a quantum computer, what's I think very interesting about SciQuantum uh, and the photonics approach is that it can leverage and does leverage the 50, 60 years of knowledge of how to scale semiconductors, right? We are all talking now from our laptops, from our phones, from all the computing devices we have, and these have uh, upwards of billions, sometimes trillions of transistors. This is an industry that understands scale. And by leveraging silicon photonics, the ability to put photonics and control photonics on the basis of silicon wafers, an industry that's well understood, foundries that have scaled and, and, uh, and implemented that and delivered to that, uh, to those kind of specs, this is an exciting moment. Uh, back in 1979, uh, when Paul Benioff wrote his first paper uh, around the possible design of a, of a quantum computer, Richard Feynman followed after that, David, David Deutsch, so many others, uh, in the early years of understanding the possibility of quantum computers, uh, this was all just a, a dream, a twinkle in the eyes of these early, early inventors. But now, um, Real people with lots of resources using scalable technologies are now on the march towards this roadmap of a fault tolerant scaled quantum computer. So it's a very exciting time, Kenna, uh, in this history. Absolutely. And talking more about that technology, let's turn over to maybe quantum sensing. So Jack, if maybe you could elaborate on some of the applications for quantum sensors, that would be great. Sure. So, you know, very often people uh, focus initially on quantum computing. And again, we, Pete and I just talked about how exciting that is. And in addition to that, it's also important to look at other quantum technologies that are now maturing alongside uh, quantum computing. Quantum sensors is a great example of that. In the case of quantum sensors, these sensors can take us beyond the classical regime to sense the world around us. One application is magnetic fields. Magnetic fields are all around us. In fact, our own bodies produce magnetic fields. We may not realize it, those viewing right now, that your heart, as an example, while it's beating, that beat comes from an electric pulse in the muscle of your heart. That electric pulse produces a magnetic field that can be detected from outside your body, from right near the chest cavity. In fact, um, we now have such a device in clinical trial at a major hospital, listening very carefully to that magnetic a uh, field that is result of the magnetic field of the heart coming from the electrical impulse of the heart every single beat. And so this becomes another modality to sense the health of the heart. We know heart disease is the number one killer still 
in the United States, in Canada, Western Europe, most other countries in the world, heart disease is still in the number one, number two slot as a killer. We need better diagnostic devices and quantum sensors can be made of quantum uh, diamonds, so-called NV diamonds. They can be made from cesium vapor uh, type sensors, so-called opt optically pumped uh, magnetometers. Lots of different ways to build quantum sensors, but they all have the same core idea. Much more sensitivity, much more ability to take in information, but why now? Why now for quantum sensing? And the answer is because of AI. Before the advent of more sophisticated AI, more sophisticated GPUs, these chips from NVIDIA that I'm sure everyone has been hearing about, before that, there was so much information coming from these quantum sensors. They're so sensitive that we couldn't really distinguish the signal from the noise. Now, with the advent of better machine learning tools, both the chip level and the models themselves that can now be on board on the actual devices themselves, in this, in this case, for example, a cardiac detection device, we now have the ability to distinguish the heart signal from somebody's iPhone that might be a few meters away. And that ability to combine the quantum sensor with great machine learning chips and models, that full stack is what's allowing quantum sensing to become a reality today. So this is something that has not received a lot of attention in the last four or five years, but I think um, listeners and viewers today on our webinar, we're going to start to hear more about it in the next few years. Back to you. Yeah, abs absolutely. And that's a perfect segue into my next question, um, which is kind of the topic of this discussion, right? The global digital divide. Um, we've already seen this with the haves and have nots when it comes to technology and who has access to uh, different things. So I'm going to start maybe with Pete for this question, but how does the advent of AI and quantum technology impact this tech divide? Um, and how do we prevent that kind of global digital divide of the past from happening with both AI and quantum computing? Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really good question. I think it's really an exciting question, actually. Um, I really like what Jack is doing with quantum sensing in that, of course, you know, billions of dollars are being spent around the world trying to get a quantum computer built. But today, nobody has a useful quantum computer. And some people would disagree with us on this, but at Psyquantum, our sort of conviction is that small quantum computers are not useful. Uh, and so what this means is that there's all of this incredible technology, NV Diamond, you know, quantum dots, superconducting qubits, all of this incredible stuff sitting on the table, not at a large enough scale yet to be useful. Um, but uh, I, I think it's really, uh, really exciting, actually, that uh, Jack and Sandbox and, and other, other people around the world are finding great uses for these kind of extraordinary devices. But that also points to, you know, a real sort of conundrum, which is that, yeah, we do think that the real quantum computers, the quantum computers that have impact are going to be gigantic, extremely expensive systems. These are not going to be democratically, uh, you know, universally accessible systems that you're going to have one in in your house these are going to be much closer to something like a semiconductor foundry where it costs a huge amount of money uh, it's rooted into the ground and there are only a handful of these systems around the world and of course right now we are grappling with the geopolitical consequences of the fact that semiconductor manufacturing is an extremely exclusive challenging uh hard to reproduce kind of technical capability. And we think that you should be realistic that quantum computing is going to go the same way. So as far as the hardware itself, we don't think that's something where it's going to be miniaturized and cheap and, 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 and universally available. We do think you have to be realistic that these are huge systems. And then like it's really important, uh, I think, for the world and, and for, for Psyquantum that we are uh, thoughtful about how we uh, tackle that that kind of reality. Uh, and so, um, you know, for instance, I would like for there to be more than one quantum computer around the world. Like, and if you're not careful, you'll end up with just one, which to me would seem like kind of a bad situation. Um, but yeah, that's definitely the sort of landscape. We see it going that way. And it's going to be hard work to mitigate that default state. Yeah. How about you, Jack? Yeah, no, thanks, Kenneth. Just to build on what Pete is talking about, 
uh, we share this concern about a repeat of the digital divide. We are all familiar with the last 20, 25 years. Uh, there were haves and have nots. Access to broadband, access to smartphones, access to apps, uh, 5G, gave access to billions of people for online education, access to markets, e-commerce, the ability to participate. Uh, there are millions and millions of small businesses uh, in the developed world that access e-commerce every day. In fact, the majority of sellers on Amazon are third-party sellers, not Amazon itself. And this creates massive job opportunity, manufacturing opportunity, and product opportunity for all those millions of sellers. But we also know that billions of people were left out of that digital revolution until very recently. They didn't have access to great online education. They didn't have access if a woman was pregnant and wanted information on maternity health to get access to that on a ready basis because they didn't have access to that smartphone technology. Now, the good news on the digital divide, Kenna, is that recently, just starting in the last year, uh, the pricing of smartphones has come down tremendously. It's come down to under $20 per smartphone. That's a key benchmark. The majority of the world, particularly the emerging markets, do not work on a subscription basis for their phones. They have to pay it on the barrel, and they cannot amortize it the way we might do in some other countries. And so the rate of about 250 million people a quarter now, people are joining for the first time in their lives the broadband internet that we are all familiar with for so many years. So the good news is the traditional digital divide is now beginning to close. However, as that is happening, just as that is happening, AI and quantum come along and are, as Pete mentioned very well, very expensive technologies. You need to invest a lot, not just in the hardware, but also the people talent, the university programs, the PhD programs, the postdoc programs. This is, takes a lot of focus. And unfortunately, only 21 countries today out of the 180 plus countries around the world have a quantum blueprint, a national strategy. And of those 21, only 13 have funded that program to any significant degree. Our concern that we wanted to raise on this webinar, Pete and myself, is a call to action. A call to action that says governments of the world, organizational bodies, universities, venture capitalists, let's work together to bring technology to a wider set of countries so we don't have a repeat of the digital divide. Now, as Pete mentioned very correctly, it's not that we're going to be able to build a full-scale quantum computer in every country. That is not realistic. But what is realistic is that first, quantum computers are really the first hardware revolution we've had in 70 years that is cloud native. And we hope that the large-scale fault-tolerant quantum computers will be, and we expect them to be accessible via the cloud. But to make that work, to make that reality, we have to make sure there are quantum ready engineers in every single country. So countries don't need necessarily to build their own quantum computer, but once they start existing and they're available over the cloud, we wanna make sure there's cohorts of even a few hundred engineers in each country who know how to utilize and leverage this incredible computing power that will work hand in hand with classical computing power as well. That takes, we have to start now. You can't snap your fingers and have a PhD cohort overnight. That doesn't happen. It's time to start now. We've been investing in 43 university programs around the world for the past five years. We've been collaborating with Sci Quantum in a number of, of those universities to make sure that there are enough and sufficient masters, PhDs, postdocs, engineers of all kinds who can understand the technology get familiar with the technology, and also bring domain expertise. For example, if we might have a domain expert in pharmaceuticals, in, in pharmaceutical development. We might have a domain expert in battery chemistry. We need those folks to get trained in the understanding of using quantum computers. In quantum computing, we don't have the same operators that we use in traditional computing. We have different gates. Uh, people may be familiar with the C not gate as one example. Can't do that on the class of computer. Fundamental to the kinds of stuff work that Pete and I do in the quantum computing world. So let's use the next four, five, six years to really invest in the talent to make sure we can close this divide before it opens up as a big breach. Back to you, Kevin. 
Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. To come up, kind of summarize both your thoughts, it sounds like the global digital divide isn't just hardware software, but it is the workforce as well, um, which I think is a very apt point to make. Excellent. Um, so my next question for you is how this technology can be harnessed across various sectors and specifically if you could kind of share um, more particular use cases for each of these sectors. So I'll turn it over to maybe Pete first and then Jack. Does that work? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, Great. So, uh, so um, you know, quantum, the, the, the quantum computer that we are building and that I think most people are building is a general purpose machine. And I think it's pretty relevant to think about the early days of conventional computing. If you had gone back to the time of Alan Turing and others and asked them what they were gonna do with these machines when they were first building them, I think they would have said something like, well, we're gonna do code breaking because uh, there's a war on. Uh, we're gonna you know, maybe calculate some ballistics trajectories and I don't know, we'll find out. And honestly, to some extent, quantum computing is roughly at that stage. If you ask experts in quantum computing what the application space is, they give you a pretty standard short list of things where we can see enough into the future to be pretty confident that those are going to be valuable applications. And those mostly sit uh, in the regime of simulating molecules, uh, chemistry, drugs, materials, uh, simulating physics, uh, and uh, and chemistry is really sort of where we think these early applications are, and uh, we as a, as, a, as an organization are especially excited about the potential impact there in, in climate uh, science. Uh, so whether that is designing new drugs, new catalysts for carbon sequestration, uh, solving the extremely inefficient ways that we currently make fertilizer, uh, looking for new ways to do um, photovoltaic solar cells. Uh, green hydrogen. These are all, you know, technologies that sit on a foundation of chemistry and very often involve uh, very small molecules that are great targets for relatively early fault tolerant quantum computers uh, and where the, the potential for quantum computing uh, to um, remove a bunch of work from the problem and avoid a whole bunch of costly experimentation, trial and error, uh, I think is really, really exciting. Um, so yeah, we're really psyched about that um, as, a, as a potential application area. But you know, also personally, I'm kind of excited for us to be wrong uh, as we were with conventional computers and to find you know, uh, vast areas of un, un, unimagined territory. Um, so we'll see uh, which, which of those comes to, comes to life, yeah. Excellent, and Jack? Sure, yeah, no, just to build on what Pete said, um, absolutely agree on the simulation again our world at the fundamental level is quantum the language that molecules speak when they meet each other and say are we going to bind together are those valence electrons on one molecule uh in the body going to bind with the valence electrons on a receptor these are quantum questions and the ability to uh run that in simulation is going to be very very exciting in fact i would go so far as to predict that the word simulation the term simulation will be as big and on people's tongues today, you know, in say two, three, four years, uh, the way that some AI terms are today. Um, the time is coming soon when uh, basically everything in our world will want to simulate. And today, of course, we simulate Newtonian macro kinds of effects. So when you're designing the next Boeing, the next Airbus, uh, we don't necessarily build clay models anymore and put them in, in actual wind tunnels. First, simulation is done uh, in computer systems that are built today that run on Newtonian principles of aerodynamics and understanding the shape of the airfoil. But now we're going to be able to bring it into the quantum world, right? And that's a very, very exciting prospect. So simulation for sure. Another area just to build um, on a further area is beyond even uh, immediate tangible application is physics itself. Uh, we held a workshop a number of years ago on the use of quantum computers uh, as they scale to deepen our understanding and discoveries and the nature of our own universe. Now, you might say, well, what's the practical application of that? But again, we know anyone who's been in an MRI machine, anyone who's used a laser for to help their eyes uh, put the retina back on in a retina tear, anyone who's benefited from any of these technologies has benefited from quantum mechanics. 
And that was built and, and discovered, and uh, that framework was built by a series of very free-thinking uh, scientists about 100 years ago, so universe more deeply. And when we look at the state of theoretical physics today, we're in a very deep conundrum. We're, we're kind of stuck to some extent uh, in the state of theoretical physics. And so I think it's very exciting to think about a system, a quantum computer at scale, that we can start to do not just simulations of real world stuff. Yes, of course, we're going to improve battery chemistry and solar panels, as Pete just mentioned, and molecule to medicine. All that, I believe, is going to happen even a greater scale than today. But we're also going to start to deepen our understanding of the universe itself. We have two fundamental theories of, in, in physics today. Don't seem to want to talk to each other very well. A theory of gravity, uh, general relativity, known as, and, and a theory of quantum physics. And they're both experimentally very well founded. We can't seem to get it all together uh, in one unified way. We need to run simulations of certain ideas, of certain ideas of black holes as uh, complexity machines, as machines essentially that, that scramble information, as we say, or able to process information in ways that we can only start to imagine. Um, deepen our understanding so we can understand our universe itself. Only 4.5% of our universe is the stuff that we can see and touch, the matter, the energy around us. Uh, the other 90 plus percent, we have a very, very basic understanding of, be it dark matter or dark energy. And so the ability to have a quantum computing device that we can start to test some hypotheses um, may seem like a far out idea. But I think once we get hold of this technology, it'll become a very exciting tool of discovery as well. Pete, back to you. Yep. Uh, I will uh, second everything that you just said, um, uh, Jack. And uh... Um, oh, something came to mind, but now it's disappeared. Let me see if I can recover it from my brain here. Oh yeah, just just to say that you know, if if, if you look across the uh, the Fortune 100, Fortune 500, like you see these huge corporations. I think it's really nice to look at that through a lens of like, what are these corporations actually sitting on top of? And again, it's like car company, materials company, energy company, pharmaceutical company. Like they really are despite the fact that there's a huge number of middle management and sales teams and whatever, whatever, the foundations of those things really are like uh, chemistry and physics. And I think it's also the case that many of these organizations have essentially been able to rest on their laurels for decades. Like they've been able to use the same chemistries, the same physics, the same molecules without really having to innovate for a long time. And suddenly that's changing, whether it's due to decarbonization, whether it's due to supply chain stuff, whether it's due to pure com competitiveness, um, they're suddenly having to look for new ways to do things. Uh, and that requires them to have a very good grip on chemistry and physics. And that's, yeah, pretty pretty exciting if you're building a quantum computer to see that kind of landscape. And, and Ken, if I could just add to what Pete's saying, just to give some sure. specific numbers, um, both Pete and I have talked about the pharma sector um, the current dynamics in the pharma sector are very challenging. The average small molecule is an example. Most of the drugs out there today are what's called small molecule drugs. The average drug to get from molecule to approved medicine is about 13 to 14 years. The average cost is about two and a half billion dollars. And even after all that spent of time and, and, and money, uh, on average, when you look at a drug that enters into clinical trials, let's remember that Clinical trials have three phases, phase one, safety, phase two, signs of efficacy, phase three, scale up to a larger cohort. About 70% of all drugs that enter clinical trial fail. I mean, that's just an astounding and a really sobering number. And one of the reasons why we don't have good drugs today for Alzheimer's, for Parkinson's, for glioblastoma, brain cancer, for pancreatic cancer, so many key diseases that kill so many people that really um, also destroy health span, not just lifespan. And we don't, it's not for lack of trying. Drug companies are trying, they're working on these problems, but the, the, the numbers are just daunting in terms of lack of success. So the ability to build on what's happening now, already a number of us are working on simulations using today's best hardware, the classical hardware, we're making headway there. 
But once we can then add in quantum computers at scale and have the ability to, at a much greater scale, be able to manipulate and understand and design these, these drugs, uh, that's going to allow us to really break through the numbers of today, really change the terms on the 70, 80 percent failure rate that happens today. And unfortunately, by the way, 40 percent of that failure happens in phase three, the latest stage, the most expensive stage, not just most expensive for cost, most expensive for patients' lives. And, uh, and this is something that I, I'm really hopeful uh, and I know, uh, you know, the site quantum team um, shares this view, really hopeful we can break through on as we scale this kind of computation. Kenna, back to you. Yeah, absolutely. This has been some uh, very informative discussion. And I know a lot of people have been commenting about um, just some of the different kind of uh, topics that you both have been already chatting about. So I am going to take a few questions from the audience. Um, the first one is at what point in the development of quantum technologies or at what levels of the field do you think that there will be more demand for people in the field that don't necessarily come from a background in higher education research? Um, the person commented, it's an exciting field to think about working in, but when you look at the current job market, it's hard to find anything asking for less than a master's degree. Yeah, so, so I will turn it over to either of you. Why don't you, why don't you start, Pete? I'll, I'll jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, a quantum computer needs to be a very large machine that is built by a supply chain that looks like the same supply chain that builds conventional supercomputers, semiconductor devices, systems, etc. And that is definitely not a bunch of experimental physicists, right? Like if you look at the current quantum computing efforts, they're dominated by experimental physicists. One of the things that I'm most proud of at SciQuantum is that we aren't. So we have a cohort of like PhDs in quantum information and blah, blah, blah. But increasingly, you know, we're hiring people who are doing welding, concrete, steel, uh, like we, we, and that to me is a signal of the maturity that we're starting to approach like the, the technical challenges that we face increasingly are not esoteric quantum physics where you need a phd um, and so i'm really excited about that and it's a, it's a real pleasure actually to work with a team that isn't just a bunch of phds in quantum computing um, and i hope that we're on a monotonic trajectory to increase uh that uh that sort of uh, character of, of, of what we do yeah jack how about you uh, sure just to add to that uh, no, I think the question is correct that a lot of the job postings that you see today uh, do involve some advanced you know, work that people have done, be it master's, PhD, or postdoc. Uh, and again, uh, both Pete's company and our own have, uh, have and are investing heavily uh, to, you know, in, those, in those university programs. A at the same time, I think as the industry grows, there will be uh, an increasing number of jobs for uh, engineers with good practical experience who did not study. Again, the majority of engineers today who are in the workforce did not study quantum in their undergraduate or graduate uh, program. And that's OK. Uh, this is also the golden age as it happens, not just of quantum and AI, but also of education. Uh, there's more and more courses online. Uh, we're putting out courses online. If you check out our website at Sandbox AQ, but also MIT has tons of great courses. Lots of other folks, Coursera, Udacity, Brilliant. If people want to check out a really cool app, uh, there's an app called Brilliant. In your spare time, instead of doom scrolling or checking TikTok, you can check out uh, Brilliant. It's a wonderful app. I have no stake in Brilliant whatsoever. I just happen <laughs> to think it's a really cool app that has some great content on it uh, for, for quantum, for AI. And it's a great way to spend a few minutes while you're, you know, between other things, you can learn about that stuff. So this is a great moment for upskilling. And I think that to the questioner's uh, point, this is a moment when people can say, you know what, I'm open for a career change. I've been doing, say, coding, Python coding or C, C++ coding for a number of years now in a certain application area or general enterprise computing. Uh, now I'd like to take a deep dive into this area. And, and this is a great moment that people should think about starting that skill journey. Uh, we're doing that around the world in a number of different programs, and, and I invite people to come in. Uh, this will be a, mar a, a market and a, uh, you know, a sector that needs all kinds of skill sets, 
And then as the market matures, we'll also need marketing folks, biz dev. Already there's a number of biz dev positions open at all, but there will be an increasing number as companies, Pete just mentioned a, the list of companies, energy companies, chemical companies, pharmaceutical companies, each one of these will need their own teams to fully understand and leverage the coming quantum platforms. Uh, hospitals that are now, we're introducing quantum sensors to, we're starting to do training in hospitals of what quantum sensors are, how to use them in diagnostics. And so if you're interested in the medical field and the cross of medical with quantum, that's gonna be an exciting job opportunity as well. So I think it's a very exciting moment. I encourage people to think about upskilling, reskilling uh, in this area and crossing it with a domain expertise, be it clean energy, pharmaceuticals, hospital healthcare, or other aspects as well. Back to you, Kenneth. Yeah, absolutely. Great advice, Jack, and same to you, Pete. So the next question from our audience, um, Jack, I'll have you answer this one. First is, what are the biggest challenges holding back quantum computers? You can answer that however you would like. Well, I think that uh, there, there's several challenges. The good news is we have a lot more momentum now in this uh, sector than we did even just four or five years ago. Uh, it's a lot clearer uh, what the roadmap is. We understand the engineering challenges ahead of us as a, as a collective industry. Uh, each engineering challenge is, is getting overcome again and again. One of the key questions there's been a lot of good activity on is on error correction. And there were certain folks who were skeptical a number of years ago, whether as you scale the number of qubits, could you really make sure you're uh, mitigating and then managing and then ultimately correcting for the errors uh, that, that are occurring. And now we have increasing evidence from a number of different groups, both in industry and academia, that indeed, as you scale, we can manage the noise. We can manage that and we can keep coherence um, for circuit depths, which is just a fancy way of saying, getting enough operations done in an appropriate time that we can actually do meaningful work. So it's now clear much more so than four or five years ago that we have the ability as a sector to build these kinds of machines. So that's the first thing that I think that now um, uh, we have much more visibility on. Second, in terms of challenges, is education. It's not just the education that Pete and I just talked about of the workforce, but also at the customer bases, at the governments. A lot of what Pete and I do and others in the industry who help lead this industry at many different companies is engage with governments on a pro bono basis to say, let's explain, let's share with you the exciting roadmap ahead. And I think it's incumbent upon the industry to continue to do that. It's a welcome task that we all take up, a baton on, we all share that task. And we've been down to DC, to other capitals around the world to talk about this. The good news is that we're starting to see more and more countries engage in quantum blueprints, uh, the topic we mentioned before, Kenna. And so that's one of the key challenges that remains though, is constantly updating folks on that this is really taking a big step forward in the next few years. Over to you, Pete. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great summary, Jack. Definitely, we we think that error correction is extremely important uh, to do something useful, and it's awesome to see these demonstrations from uh, other teams that are just incredible pieces of, of technical work. And as you say, like very reassuring to see uh, that they can indeed correct errors. As far as like the hardest challenges uh, in quantum computing, there's lots of different ways to build a qubit, and everybody loves to fight over who has the best qubit. And everyone will tell you that their qubit is the best and everybody else's qubit, here are the problems. Uh, the reality is, as Jack said, like a lot of great work has been done and everyone's qubit now is actually pretty impressive. Like superconducting qubit, quantum dot, ion trap, NV diamond, whatever, they're all great. And I would say that the challenges are actually now scaling. And specifically, we talk in terms of manufacturability. So how are you gonna build millions of them that all work really well? Uh, Connectivity, how are you going to network chips together? Uh, control electronics is becoming increasingly a sort of theme uh, that's holding back uh, teams. Uh, and then cryogenic cooling power. These systems all need to be cooled to very low temperatures. And uh, as a community, we need a lot more cryogenic cooling power uh, than we currently have uh, to play with uh, to build these, these big, big systems. Um, the good news is that none of those challenges 
are strictly speaking quantum computing challenges or quantum physics challenges. They're really closer to scaled engineering problems that have been solved or similar things have been solved previously in the world. Um, so that gives me a lot of, a lot of hope for, for overcoming these problems. Absolutely. So I will end our uh, discussion with one final question. Uh, thank you again for both taking the time to share your wisdom and expertise with us. Um, the last audience question I've picked is uh, more about quantum education and talking again about that global digital divide when it comes to education and workforce. Um, this person wrote, as a prospective PhD student, are there particular programs that you recommend I apply to? And I, mean, I can kick off and then turn to I can kick off and turn to Pete as well. Um, first of all, there's some really great programs now. And depending where geographies, there's now, you know, across all geographies, there's really wonderful programs. Um, and, and again, if people want to reach out to either Pete or myself, either Site Quantum or Sandbox AQ, our teams can, you know, give you even more detail. To highlight just a few programs, uh, be it starting in Canada with University of Waterloo and many other programs in Canada along, um, you know, stalwart in supporting this kind of research and these kind of PhD programs. Jumping over to Europe, for example, at Delft, uh, incredible work being done in the Netherlands with PhD programs there. Of course, Oxford and Cambridge, Imperial, uh, Bristol, where an, uh, some of the technology and Imperial uh, of PsyQuantum came out of, both Bristol University and Imperial, uh, very strong programs there. And then as you move to the continent, um, uh, you know, you have the Polytechnique, uh, and uh, ANS in, in France, as well as University of Barcelona, I would highlight in Spain. Uh, coming back to the US, uh, really strong programs at MIT and Harvard. Uh, Will Oliver at MIT is leading a very strong program and building out uh, investment in PhDs over there. And then of course in Caltech in Pasadena, Stanford, UC Berkeley, uh, very strong programs there alongside the national labs. Uh, moving over to University of Chicago, the Chicago ecosystem has really grown up very significantly now because of the two national labs, because of the leadership of Paul, uh, the, the president of University of Chicago, and uh, his entire team over there. Very impressive what they have done. Uh, and then, of course, moving over to NYU, Columbia, uh, and CUNY uh, has recently come out with uh, very strong photonics programs as well. Um, that we're supporting in that particular case. So, you know, really good programs around the world. We're hoping to see more programs, though, in the Global South. We don't see enough there yet. Um, those listening to us here, please reach out to Pete or myself. We're both interested in supporting more work in the Global South. Uh, there's something called Quantum South, based out of Brazil, uh, which we're engaged with uh, to try to encourage more work uh, being done there. There's some budding programs in the Middle East uh, that we're we're supporting. Uh, and then, of course, in Asia, uh, Singapore has very, very strong programs uh, and other countries in Asia are starting to ramp up. And of course, Australia, to end with, with the Sydney Quantum Academy, if you do want to go down under, really great programs uh, in, in Australia uh, with four universities banding together to create an excellent PhD program. So a lot of choices, but we'd like to see more in the Global South. Pete? That is an extraordinarily good summary, Jack. Like, I like I don't know how you do that. Like, that that, that list. I mean, I've hung around in academia for a long time, but that that's an incredibly good summary. Just do whatever Jack just said. The only thing I will <laughs> Thanks, add Chris. is that, you know, like it is it, it, it it's a fact that quantum computing has very high overlap with like elite technical university programs. Uh, I would also make a little bit of a counterpoint, which is that that is also part of the pathology of quantum computing, which is that it's super fascinating. There's a lot of people running around who say they're really smart, and in many cases are really smart. You gotta also, like, don't take your eyes off the prize. Like, you have to build something that really works. And, you know, when I've learned things in my life, it's mostly been uh, when I've been obsessed with something that's just gotta get built. And I've, you know, contributed to building it. And so, yeah, I think um, Jack has given you the ideal rundown there of your target universities, um, but also make sure that you build something that works <laughs> when you're there. Yeah, and Pete, Pete, let me just let me just build on what Pete said. We absolutely agree with that. And and what one thing we realized about six, seven years ago 
uh, is that just hiring PhDs from great universities was not going to be enough. Uh, they came to us with great credentials, great smarts, as people just saying, but very little practical knowledge and experience. And so we decided back then to really start investing earlier in the process. We launched something called the residency program and uh, the ability for people while they're getting their master's or PhD or a postdoc to spend time on real world projects, uh, getting paid a substantial amount as well in a stipend to support their education. But the main thing people are getting is this real world experience. It's something we call the residency program, which people can find out about uh, online. And, and to Pete's point, that's why we started it, because we need to help the PhD programs around the world to have people get practical experience. How do you work with a foundry the way Pete does, you know, in scaling silicon photonics? How do you do that? One highlight I'd just like to mention is University of Vilnius, Lithuania, reached out to us, didn't have a quantum computing program, didn't have a track for PhDs or masters, had strong physics, strong mathematics from a long legacy of those two areas in Vilnius, but didn't have a specific quantum technology program. And, and, and we and others in a pro bono way helped set that up. And now it's being taught uh, as a track there. So, but what's critical is, again, back to Pete's point, um, get exposure, not just to the theory, not just to the specifics on, say, quantum computing, but of foundries, of, of silicon, of wafer technology. How do you get uh, to a scalable solution? Wh whether you choose that one or you want to choose some other modality, that's fine. If you want to choose ion traps or you know other modalities, get familiar with the actual places that build the stuff. And, and try to get hands-on experience while you're a student, not just thinking you're getting it afterwards. It's a little late afterwards to make that decision as to where to work after your degree. So I would strongly encourage uh, joining a, a, an internship, a residency program while you're getting your PhD or master's, uh, and then try to do a postdoc at one of the companies. More and more companies like us at Sandbox AQ, we're offering full-time two, three-year postdoc positions and, and other companies are starting to do this as well, which we're excited about. We want people to do this as well. That gives people hands-on experience to build real products. Uh, and that's been one of the hallmarks that Pete and Jeremy have led on and, and others now are, are following. Absolutely, yes. No, thank you both for, for sharing your ideas about that and suggesting places. I know that'll be very helpful for people in the future. Um, well, thank you everyone for watching this event and for inputting your questions. Um, if you have any more, please follow up with SciQuantum or Sandbox AQ and their teams. They'll be happy to share more resources as this uh, progresses. Um, we will be sending you the recording of this event um, as well as other resources um, in an email. Um, so keep your inboxes open for that. But thank you again, Jack and Pete, for just taking the time to chat Thanks with all of us about your experiences. Great Thank to you. see you Real all. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Kenna. Thanks so much. Beautiful questions, fun conversation. Thanks, Kenna. Cheers, Jack. Thank you. See you all very soon.